Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 tier list and guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today, we are continuing with my consumables tier list. And in fact, we are concluding my consumables tier list because we are actually finished talking about all of the consumables once we've covered poisons, oils, and weapon coatings. Poisons, oils, and weapon coatings all have very similar properties in that you can apply them to your weapon and use them as part of an attack. And so I'm covering them all together, but actually many of these items behave quite differently. And so knowing which ones can be thrown and which ones cannot, how they behave differently when thrown and when used on your weapons, and what they actually do, because often the descriptions on these items are particularly unclear, um, even for Baldur's Gate tooltips, can be extremely helpful for your honor mode runs. You can almost always apply a weapon coating before a combat begins, because they last for a long time, and they just activate every time you attack with a weapon. So you are giving up a lot of value if you're not using these regularly, because it has very little opportunity cost and can add quite a lot of power to your party in order to have ac uh, if you have access to these for important combats or even just for every combat. The ability also to throw them like grenades is incredibly valuable in some encounters and is particularly useful with some of the more powerful poisons, so I will talk about which ones are better actually applied to a weapon and which ones are better thrown, and how and when you should use all of the potions, oils, and weapon coat all of the poisons, oils, and weapon coatings available in Baldur's Gate 3. Before I begin, I do want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to Very Fallible for the $25 donation, Joe Rundle for the $15, Ferry Grignard for the 2.5 euros, and Trengilly for the $10, as well as Matthew Day and Juliana Thomas for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support, and it really does mean a lot. And if I've mispronounced anyone's name, please, as always, let me know in the comments. Similar to potions, these weapon coatings have no downsides and very little opportunity cost for their use. Because you will be buffing with them pre-combat, they typically don't take an action to use, or during combat will only take a bonus action, which you will only spend if you don't have something better to do with it, so it very rarely has a real action cost. And they're just free value. Anytime you'd be attacking with a weapon, it's better to be attacking with a poisoned weapon. Even the ones that have the most marginal effects, they have a small chance at a very minor effect, are just strictly better than a normal weapon attack. So it really incentivizes you to be using these constantly, and even the weakest of them is still worth using. For that reason, I've divided them, as you can see, into five tiers. In S tier, I have ones that are excellent and have incredibly powerful effects that you're going to want to use all the time. In A tier, I have either ones that are a little weaker than that or ones that are very powerful but mostly are for specific strategies or specific encounters. In B tier, I have ones that are generally pretty useful and are worth using when you don't have the S tier poisons available or in encounters that might be immune to those. In C tier, I have ones with minor effects but that are still generally worth uh, using, and in D tier I have ones with effects that are still better than nothing, there, but are so minor that honestly you can forget about these poisons or sell them for gold, and you won't really be losing out on anything. You'll notice that compared to my other consumable tier lists, there is no S plus tier, because I don't believe any of them have uh, totally game-breaking effects, and there's no F tier because the, they are all better than nothing, so they're all worth using. Before I begin rating the individual weapon coatings, though, let's take a quick moment to talk about how they actually work. These weapon coatings are fairly complex, and many of them work differently, so I think it's worth talking about the actual mechanics of how you apply them, because we'll need to know that in order to rate them. There are three different ways that you can apply these weapon coatings to an enemy. The first is by coating your weapon with it and then hitting them. You can use these all as a bonus action from your inventory and it coats your weapon in that poison for 10 turns. You do this by activating it uh, from your inventory as a bonus action. It will coat both your main hand and offhand weapon if you have two weapons equipped, but it won't coat both your melee and ranged weapons. If you want both of those coated, you have to do them separately. Then you attack an enemy with it to apply the effect. Secondly, you can dip the uh, dip your weapons in a pool of the poison. Some of these poisons or oils or coatings, when thrown, create a pool of that effect at the location. Typically, this pool will cause enemies standing in it to suffer the effects of the poison, but also if it's a pool on the ground, you can dip your weapons in it to apply the coating of the, the 
the effect to your weapons, same as if you had activated it from your inventory. This takes a bonus action and also lasts for 10 turns and is exactly the same as coding your weapon. So if you want multiple characters in your party to have the poison on it, on them, you can gain value by throwing your poison on the ground and then having your whole party dip their weapons in the poisoned pool rather than activating it from your inventory. That way you can have one bottle of these poisons work as up to four bottles of poison for attacking an enemy. Finally, you can hit the enemy with it as though it is a grenade. Many of these uh, oils can be thrown, many of these poisons can be thrown, and it will create a pool or a cloud of the poison at the location. The ones that make clouds you can't dip your weapons into, but they will still apply the effect to enemies. However, it's important to note that when thrown as a grenade, most of these poisons have reduced effects compared to the version that's applied from your weapon attacks. So if you hit an enemy with a grenade of this poison, typically it will have a shorter duration and often a lower save DC. So you can maybe hit multiple enemies with it at once because it's an AoE effect when you hit them with a, a potion, but it will often be at a reduced effect. Sometimes that can still be the right thing to do because hitting multiple enemies at a time is good, um, and sometimes you just have a bonus action to throw it at range and can't make a weapon attack, so it can still be a very useful tool to be able to throw these, but it's important to know that they will often have different save DCs or different effects when thrown when we're actually raiding the poisons. All right, let's get to talking about the individual poisons. First up, the basic poison. As the imaginative name implies, this is probably the first poison that you're going to encounter during the game, and it just applies the poisoned condition. You can use it either by coating a weapon uh, from your inventory with it, or by throwing it as a grenade, but not by dipping, because it creates a cloud rather than a surface, so you can't dip your weapons in it. Either way, the effect of the poison is that an enemy struck by it or standing in the cloud has to make a DC 11 saving throw, a con saving throw, or become poisoned, which gives them disadvantage on attack rolls and skill checks. The poisoned condition is a pretty reasonable condition. If you know that the enemy is going to get another turn in combat, giving them poisoned can make them a lot less likely to hit you, and especially in some of the early game encounters, which is where you would conceivably be using this item, disadvantage can on enemy attacks can really make the difference between your party living and not living. However, DC 11 con save is extremely low. Enemies are uh, very, very likely to pass it. Constitution saves are typically the worst save to target, even in the very early game. Enemies will often have plus two or higher bonuses to their con saves, and of course those go up drastically as you go on later in the game. And when combined with the plus two bonus that all uh, characters get to their saving throws, all enemies get to their saving throws on Tactician or Honor, they're extremely unlikely to reliably fail the save against the basic poison. However, Something is always better than nothing, and the basic poison you are very likely to have access to before you get access to any other better poisons, and the ability to potentially give one of the dangerous early game bosses disadvantage on their attack rolls for a combat is definitely uh, powerful. It's absolutely worth using this in those early game fights because they will typically go for multiple turns. You don't yet have the tools to end them in a single turn. The enemies will typically get off some attacks, and so them having disadvantage can be pretty useful. Obviously, you are very quickly going to move away from the basic poison, and the likelihood of it changing an encounter from a one encounter, from a lost encounter to a one encounter, I will admit is not very high, but in the early game, especially on honor mode, um, which is where you're most likely to lose, every little bit helps, so it can definitely be worth remembering that the basic poison exists and using it in the early game. I'm going to place it in C tier because of the extremely low save DC and the fact that enemies need to get an extra turn before it actually does it, need to get another turn in the combat before it actually does anything. You'd typically rather have a poison that is proactive rather than uh, defensive, but um, for the early game, it does the job, and it is better than nothing, so you'll use it sometimes, C tier. Next, 
the simple toxin. So I've grouped all four of the toxins here together because they all work in exactly the same way. You can apply them in all three of the possible ways to apply weapon coatings. You can either use them on your weapons, or you can dip your weapons in a pool of them, because all of them make a surface that, when thrown. And this surface also lasts forever, as long as it's not replaced with another surface, so you can keep enemies trapped in it to try to consistently reapply the effects. So you can throw them, you can dip them, or you can apply them. Uh, all of them will cause the enemy to suffer from a toxin condition if they fail the saving throw, which will not take effect until the end of their next turn, the end of their next turn, and then it'll do some damage. How much damage and how difficult the saving throw is will depend on the different toxins, but basically how it will work is that you can never get multiple applications of this on a single enemy in, in a single turn, because it doesn't affect them until the end of their next turn, and the effect doesn't stack. But you do get multiple tries at applying it, uh, because the enemy will keep having to make the con save until they finally fail it. So you'll usually, if you apply these toxins to your whole party, be able to fairly reliably get the effect, but then you have to wait until the end of the enemy turn before that effect actually takes place. The simple toxin itself has a DC 11 constitution save um, and does 1d4 damage at the end of the enemy's turn if they fail the saving throw. So you hit them with a weapon, they make a saving throw, if they fail it they'll take 1d4 damage at the end of their next turn. The inherent problem with this is that if you want to do additional damage, you want it now, right? The point of damage is to kill enemies before they get to do stuff. So Having the damage not take effect until the end of the enemy's next turn, guaranteeing that they will get a, another set of actions before these do anything, is a real problem for a damage-based item. It doesn't actually, under most circumstances, help you kill the enemy faster unless the encounter was going to go for multiple turns uh, already, which is something that you will typically try to avoid having encounters go really long. Um, and so you just aren't going to get a lot of damage value out of these. The simple toxin itself has the added problem that it is a DC 11 constitution save for 1d4 damage at the end of the enemy's next turn. Uh, and a DC 11 constitution save is extremely low. Enemies are very, very likely to pass that saving throw, and so even with your whole party attacking, there's a very good chance that the simple toxin will never actually trigger on an enemy because DC 11 is just extremely low. Constitution is the worst save to target, and um, most enemies, even in the early game, will have a reasonable bonus to con saves, plus the additional bonus they get on high difficulty settings. And so they're just very unlikely to fail this saving throw, and if they do, 1d4 damage at the end of their turn just isn't going to do anything. The simple toxin, if thrown as a grenade, it, um, it's hard to keep enemies in, it doesn't have a high AoE or anything like that, so the one chance at a DC 11 save or they take 1d4 damage if you let them live through their next turn is just not worth it. The only circumstance where you would really want to use the simple toxin is if you have no other weapon coatings, so you might as well, or you are you have a character who has just a bonus action they have literally no other use for, so they might as well throw something, but under most circumstances, the simple toxin is just not going to come up, and I think you can pretty safely ignore it, D tier the serpent fang toxin. So the serpent fang toxin is exactly the same as the simple toxin, works in the same way, except that the save DC is 13 instead of 11, and the damage is 1d6 instead of 1d4. This is a, a moderate increase. 13 is reaching a breakpoint where it is more likely for early game enemies to actually fail the roll against the Serpent Fang Toxin. Um, and But 1d6 damage is still just not a lot of damage. 1d6 damage per turn is very, very little. And so even if used uh, on your whole party, it's just not going to be a significant damage boost to your party overall. Compare this item to like an Alchemist Fire Grenade, which sets an enemy on fire guaranteed, so it does at least 1d4 damage guaranteed. And you can see why these toxins toxins are just not very valuable, and they use your weapon coating slot, because you can only have weapon coating uh, at a time, um, only one coating at a time, for a very marginal effect. Serpent Fang Toxin, also D tier. 
Next, the Wyvern Toxin. So the Wyvern Toxin is the same as the previous two toxins, but in this case has DC 15 uh, con save and does 1d8 damage. 1d8 damage is uh, enough damage that it is starting to be a little bit relevant. If a fight is going to go for multiple turns, like say three turns, 1d8 damage per turn does start to add up and can actually shave a turn off the time to kill a boss in some circumstances. DC 15 saving throw is high enough that in the very early game enemies will pretty reliably fail that, even though it targets Khan, which is again the worst save to target, a DC 15 saving throw is high enough that enemies will sometimes fail it. The cool thing about the Wyvern Toxin, though, is that you get it very, very early. So even though, like the other toxins, it's a pretty weak item overall, thanks to story events and just their placement in the game, depending on your routing through Act 1, you can have the, the Wyvern Toxin extremely early and use it for some of the very earliest game fights, which are often the most difficult and most dangerous. At the point in the game where you get the Wyvern Toxin, it's often the best choice you have for a weapon coating. Dipping your whole party's uh, weapons in the Toxin will just speed up your time to kill on some of the very early game fights in a pretty meaningful way, because enemies will fail the save and the damage is relevant. So thanks to getting this item super early, um, it is worth using in some of the very earliest game fights. Obviously, you're going to it's going to fall off very quickly after that, but because of where you get this item in the game, I'm going to place it in C tier because I think it is definitely worth using in some early game encounters. Next, the Purple Worm Toxin. So the Purple Worm Toxin is exactly the same as the other three toxins, except that it also breaks the pattern and the save DC, rather than going up by two, goes up by four to be a DC 19 save. The damage still just goes up by one die size to 1d10 damage. DC 19 con save is enough is high enough that enemies will pretty reliably fail it even on into the late game, but 1d10 damage at the end of the enemy turn is just not a relevant amount of damage at the stage of the game where you get the purple worm toxin. You can't get it till act 2, by which point you've got better weapon coatings uh, most of the time anyways. Um, 1d10 damage is just not relevant. Damage at the end of enemy turns is just ceased to be something that you want to do strategically. You want to be bursting down enemies if you're looking for damage at this point. And to add insult to injury, you're in Act 2, where a lot of enemies are just immune to poison damage, and that'll stay true on into the end of the game, um, where just a lot of enemies you face will be immune to poison damage. For that reason, the Purple Worm Toxin, despite the high DC, so it's a little more reliable, it's just not really an effect that you are looking for at this point. It's worth using if you don't have anything better to do, because um, 1d10 damage is not, you know, it's more than zero damage, um, and you can throw it as a grenade for some marginal effects as well if you don't have another use for a bonus action, but in general the purple worm toxin is just not going to come up particularly. Remember that this damage doesn't benefit from any other effects, it won't apply rider effects, it doesn't benefit from critical hits or anything like that, it's just flat 1d10 damage, and that's just not worth really spending your time doing at this point in the game. You're typically going to be better off selling them. D tier for the purple worm toxin, and as always when I do something like this, if you're looking to amuse yourself, you can feel free to scroll down the comments and see the people who are mad that I put the worm toxin below the wyvern toxin, um, because people do get mad when you put an objectively uh, stronger item below a weaker item, which I always find funny, because the important thing here is the context. Next, the arsonist oil. So this is a funny one, because the thing that the arsonist oil actually does and what the game says it does are completely different things. The tooltip for the arsonist oil straight up lies to the player. I think it is quite buggy in its current implementation as of the date of recording, though maybe that'll be fixed or at least clarified in the upcoming patch 7. Um, but as of right now, the game just lies to you about what the arsonist oil does. So first off, the arsonist oil can only be applied uh, by actually applying it to your weapons. You can't throw it. it um, at an enemy and it doesn't create a surface so you can't dip your weapons in it you have to actually apply it and then hit an enemy with that weapon attack if you do that it applies the arsonist oil effect with no saving throw you just have to hit with the weapon effect and the enemies get the arsonist oil effect this is where the game starts getting a little bit weird with how it works though what the arsonist oil effect says it does is remove enemy fire resistance and replace it with fire vulnerability, give that fire vulnerability instead. So you could imagine against an enemy with fire resistance, like a devil or tiefling or something like that, hitting them with arsonist oil and now instead of taking half damage from fire, they'd be taking double damage from fire. 
that's not what it does. What the arsonist oil actually does is just remove their damage resistance. Um, so an enemy who's normally resistant to fire just becomes uh, normal, it just has normal fire damage. So instead of taking half damage, they take 100% damage. That's still pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of fire resistant enemies and fire damage is a very common damage type. If you have a fire damage focused character, the arsonist oil is incredibly important because all the fire resistant enemies in the game, you can, with no saving throw, you just have to hit them with the weapon, turn off their fire resistance, um, and do full damage to them. Obviously it's not as good as if it did what it said in the tooltip and made them vulnerable, but um, even what it actually does do is very powerful. It lets you forego elemental adept on fire damage characters, and it just powers up your party significantly. Even if you don't have a fire damage focused character, your party is very likely to do a lot of fire damage. Whether you have it on your weapon, or you're throwing um, alchemist fire, or you have uh, bombs and grenades and stuff like we've talked about in previous tier lists, fire damage is just a very common elemental damage type to do, and so removing enemy resistances to it, uh, at just at the cost of putting it on, as a weapon coating on one of your weapons, is very, very powerful, even if you aren't focused on doing fire damage as a party, and if you have a fire damage focused character, then of course the arsonist oil is mandatory. It gets a little bit weirder from here, though, because there's also a trick that you can do with the arsonist oil thanks to the buggy implementation. I said that it just removes enemy fire resistance, and that's not actually true. What it seems to do is apply fire vulnerability, but not remove enemy fire resistance, so the two effects cancel out. What that means is that if you can apply temporary fire resistance to an enemy, then hit them with the arsonist oil so that they get the vulnerability and those effects can cancel out, and then remove that temporary fire resistance, you now have an enemy who's vulnerable to fire. So any enemy who uh, is not normally resistant to fire, you can give temporary fire resistance to using the wet effect, just hit them with a bottle of water, they gain fire resistance, then hit them with the arsonist oil and uh, either remove the wet effect or wait for it to time out, and suddenly you have a fire vulnerable enemy. In this way you can turn any enemy who's not naturally fire resistant into a fire vulnerable enemy and do double damage with all your fire damage. This is obviously incredibly powerful, a little finicky to set up and requires some party support to get it working, but using this technique you can double the damage with fire that all of your characters are doing, and if you have a fire damage focused character that increases their damage to uh, dramatic extent. It would probably be even better if the arsonist oil worked the way it says it does in the tooltip, because then you wouldn't have to remove the wet effect somehow, or wait for it to expire. You could just get them wet, hit them with the oil, and then hit them with fire, and they'd take a million damage. But even with the extra step, it's still an incredibly powerful and buggy tool. That being said, even without the powerful and buggy tool, the arsonist oil is still um, very good, and Obviously critical if you have a character who's focused on doing fire damage, but still extremely useful if your party just has incidental fire damage, which most parties will, just to strip off a of very common resistance and make sure you're doing full damage to those enemies. Because it only comes up in some encounters and only some parties will make maximum use of it, I'm going to place the arsonist oil in A tier, but it's definitely extremely useful. And of course, if you have a character who's focused on doing fire damage, you absolutely need it. Um, so A tier for the arsonist oil with an asterisk because some party comps are going to be using this constantly. The diluted oil of sharpness. So the diluted oil of sharpness uh, is another one that can only be applied from your inventory, it can't be thrown, it doesn't make a pool or anything on the ground, so you have to actually apply it to your weapons, so you only get one use out of one bottle of this. What it does is it gives a weapon that is coded in it a plus one enchantment, so plus one to attack and damage. And that stacks with any normal enhancement that the weapons would have. So a plus three legendary weapon can become a plus four weapon if you put the diluted oil on it. And you can stack this with a bunch of other effects to really improve your weapon. Stacks with magic weapon and everything else. It also uh, causes the weapon to become magical if it's not magical already, so it'll bypass damage resistance to non-magical effects. Ten turns of just a plus one to attack and damage um, 
for basically no resource expenditure is amazing, obviously. Increased damage is great. It's damage up front. So, and of course, the more attacks you're making, the more the oil of sharpness um, increases your damage. And plus one to hit is amazing. Um, there are basically no downsides to using the diluted oil of sharpness, and it's going to increase your damage output dramatically. Uh, so we're just going to put it right in S tier. This is a very simple one. It's just very good to use. You're just going to want to use this constantly because it's just good. S tier coding. <laughs> the drow poison. So the drow poison works very similarly to the basic poison. It can only either be applied from your inventory or thrown as a grenade because it makes a cloud rather than a surface so you can't dip your weapons in it um, and if applied uh, in your inventory you get 10 turns of drow poison on your weapons. If thrown as a grenade you get a one turn cloud that inflicts the effect on everyone in it. The effect is a DC 13 constitution saving throw which is a pretty low save that enemies will will pass pretty reliably, especially on higher difficulty settings, um, but if they fail the save, they fall asleep. They get a new saving throw at the end of each of their turns to try to wake up from this asleep effect, so it probably won't last that long, but the ability to add a save or just lose a turn to your weapon attacks is pretty incredible. Asleep is a very powerful condition, sleeping enemies can't do anything, so if they fail the save, they're going to lose a turn. Um, and the ability to just have that on your weapon attacks is really, really powerful. Remember also that these types of poisons, if you apply them to multiple enemies at once, uh, or you can apply it to multiple enemies at once if you have a weapon attack that lets you hit more than one enemy, like a Tiger Barbarian Swing or Sword Bard Flourish or uh, an Arrow of Many Targets, like we talked about in the last episode. Um, and so the Drow Poison can often be a lot of saving throws for your enemies, or they just lose the encounter immediately. One turn of not doing anything is usually enough to just win an encounter outright um, if it lands on an important enemy. So even though the saving throw isn't very high, the Drow Poison is just a very powerful effect. The downside is if they pass the saving throw, they get inoculated to it and cannot be affected by Drow Poison for two more turns. So you only get one chance per enemy to apply this in most circumstances, unless the combat goes really long. But even then, one chance per enemy to just win the fight immediately is just so powerful. Um, I'm going to put the Drow Poison in A tier because pretty uh, quickly enemies are going to start passing the saving throw very reliably because it's uh, only a DC 13. But the effect is so powerful that it's very much worth using. Um, pretty much all the way through the game, and especially in the early game where it's extremely uh, useful. As a grenade, it's also just very good. DC 13 or they fall asleep is is pretty nice, actually. So uh, DC 13 con or they fall asleep is um, pretty nice when combined with the fact that you can apply this as a weapon coating. It, so it's just worth picking up the drow poison and keeping a lot of them around because asleep is just such a powerful effect. Very good poison, A tier. The Oil of Accuracy. So the Oil of Accuracy is uh, similar to the Diluted Oil of Sharpness. It's an oil, so you can only apply it directly from your inventory, can't be thrown, can't be dipped, etc., just applied to your weapon. Um, but unlike the Oil of Sharpness, which gives plus one to attack and damage, the Oil of Accuracy gives plus two to attack. Plus two to attack is better than plus one to attack and damage. Uh, bonuses to hit are really, really important and one of the most powerful things that you can do in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the amount of average damage that you'll get out of the Oil of Accuracy is very, very high on any character that is focused on doing damage. Um, basically, you can think of this as increasing your average damage per turn by 10% of whatever your uh, base damage is, uh, just like whatever the, ever the damage of your attack is, and that's going to be a lot of damage. If you use the oil of accuracy in a fight, it's going to just increase the damage output of your characters massively, and also make them much more reliable, because hitting is good. I've already said it's better than the diluted oil of sharpness, which is in S tier, so it's probably no surprise that the oil of accuracy is also S tier. Um, when in doubt, the oil of accuracy is a little bit better, but both of these oils are incredible and you're just going to want to stockpile them and use them as much as possible. 
the oil of diminution. So the oil of diminution is a another oil, so it can only be applied directly to your weapon from your inventory um, as a bonus action, etc. Uh, and it gives you 10 turns of the effect where an enemy struck by this weapon must make a DC 11 constitution saving throw or become reduced. There is no immunity to this effect, so if you hit them lots and lots of times, they have to make this save every single time you hit them. So it will eventually probably go off in long combats if you're attacking a lot. Even though it's only a DC 11 con save, it will probably eventually work. Um, though, obviously, that's an incredibly low save DC uh, targeting a bad saving throw, so it will take a while. And the effect of reduced is that enemies deal 1d4 less damage with melee attacks, uh, have disadvantage on strength checks, and disadvantage on strength saves. Disadvantage on strength saves can be useful if you're trying to set up some sort of strength saving throw effect like an entangle or something like that that targets strength. Um, disadvantage on strength checks can let you push enemies more easily, so you could use this uh, on a character who's planning to shove a lot, like use the actual shove action um, to push enemies around with the oil of diminution, but that is just a lot of work for a very, very marginal effect. Minus 1d4 on melee damage is just not anywhere near as good, and uh, not worth anything really. Um, the cool thing is it does actually also make them smaller so you can throw them more easily, um, but the the saving throw on this is just so pitiful that enemies will pass it very reliably so you can never build a strategy around the oil of diminution because it's just not reliable to use it and uh, you know, I've I've come up with a bunch of edge cases where it like might be useful, but under most circumstances, it's just not going to do anything. In a very long fight against a melee enemy, it could save you some damage, but overall, the oil of diminution is just better off sold most of the time. D tier. The wizard bane oil. So another oil has to be applied directly from your inventory, can't be thrown or dipped or anything like that. Um, and what the wizard bane oil does is an enemy struck by it with no saving throw. So just if you hit them with the weapon that's coded in this at all, they get the wizard bane oil effect. That gives them a minus three for two turns. That gives them a minus three penalty to spell attack rolls and spell save DCs, as well as disadvantage on concentration saving throws. Importantly, uh, that disadvantage will apply if an enemy is already concentrating on a spell. So if you have an enemy who's concentrating on a spell, you pop Wizard Bane Oil and hit them, the concentration save they have to make against the damage they took from that weapon attack will have disadvantage. So you're pretty likely to be able to break enemy concentration with this on any character that does even uh, marginally reasonable damage, because uh, a decent amount of damage plus disadvantage on the concentration save, they'll very likely fail it, so you can break concentration quite reliably. Minus three to spell attack rolls and spell save DCs is a fairly marginal bonus. It's very defensively oriented, which is not what you usually want with this kind of thing. You'd much rather be proactive. Um, but against some enemy spellcasters who are going to get a turn, uh, this effect with no saving throw, you just have to hit them with a weapon attack to apply it, is quite good. Uh, I don't think that this is the best oil overall, but the ability to more reliably break enemy concentration and give enemies a penalty that has no saving throw associated with it is pretty nice. So for certain wizard encounters in the game, I think the wizard bane oil does what it says on the tin. It will cause them to just be a little bit worse at being a wizard. Um, which is sometimes all you need in order to win an encounter. This is not going to dramatically change the course of most combats. It's more in the nice-to-have section, so I'm going to place it in B tier. But the fact that it has no saving throw is really good for the Wizard's Bane oil, so in Wizard Encounters, it is worth using. Next up, Crawler Mucus, and also Carabison's Poison, which is just a unique, non-craftable non-craftable version of exactly the same thing. I decided to include it just because otherwise it might confuse people, and uh, we'll just talk about these two together. Crawler Mucus is the sort of upgraded version of the basic poison and the drow poison. It is 
ap applicable either through coating your weapon from your inventory or by throwing it as a grenade, in which case it makes a cloud that lasts for one turn and applies the effect. Different from the drow poison or the basic poison, though, the crawler mucus, if thrown, has a different save DC than it does if applied to your weapons. On your weapon attacks, it's a save DC 13, a constitution save 13, but if thrown and the cloud that it creates makes this DC 11 saving throw. So if you throw it at an enemy, it's less likely to succeed, so you're pretty incentivized to actually use this on your weapon attacks. If an enemy fails the saving throw against the crawler uh, mucus, they become poisoned, but also paralyzed for one turn. And paralysis is the best uh, it condition to apply in the entire game. It's just the most debilitating condition in the game. Completely stops them from acting for a full turn, because the, it doesn't tick down until the end of their turn, so you get one turn of no actions, which is already great, but then it also guarantees critical hits from attacks made within 10 feet. If you're using the Crawler Mucus on a melee character, it means any subsequent attacks they make are going to automatically critical. Similar to the Drow Poison and the Basic Poison, it has the inoculated effect, where after, if they uh, pass their first saving throw against this, which they're fairly likely to, because DC 13 is not that high, um, they become immune to it, so you can't like spam out a lot of attempts until the enemy fails. But even like a 25% chance per enemy, per encounter, of taking them out immediately uh, with the crawler mucus is incredibly strong. This won't come, won't work that often, but it will work often enough that it's just going to win encounter after encounter on its own. So any encounter where an enemy is not immune, where the enemies are not immune to being poisoned, Crawler Mucus can just instantly win the encounter. It gives you a pretty small random chance of doing that, but a small random chance of, of winning an encounter is absolutely worth the no resources that you're spending on it. It's not like you're spending an action or on this or anything, because you just use it before the fight starts. And then you just get like a 20-25% chance um, when a uh, combat starts of just instantly winning it. And against enemy uh, encounters with multiple enemies, you can apply Crawler Mucus across the whole encounter with arrows of many targets, or just by shooting them each in turn or something like that. Very good on archers, because you can just uh, try your luck at each enemy in the opening round of combat. Very good on fighters, because you can action surge and just try hitting each enemy to see if they happen to fall over to the crawler mucus. Um, just the, the sheer power of this effect and the chance of just instantly winning encounters with it puts it all the way up in S tier. It's not as reliable as the oil of sharpness or the oil of accuracy, but when it works, oh boy, does it ever work. So S tier poison for the crawler. Crawler Mucus, as well as Carabison's Poison, which does exactly the same thing. Next up, Malice. So Malice is another poison, using exactly the same mechanics as the Crawler Mucus, Drow Poison, and Basic Poison. You can either apply it to your weapon directly from your inventory, or throw it as a grenade, where it'll make a cloud. If you throw it as a cloud, the cloud will last for one turn. Um, whereas if you apply it to your weapon, it'll last for ten. The difference with Malice is that it has a radically different saving throw if applied to your weapon than it does if thrown as a grenade. If applied to your weapon, it's got save DC of 15, DC 15 con save, but if thrown as a grenade, it's only a DC of 10, which is so low that I kind of wonder if it was a typo when they were entering this uh, item into the item database. That extreme difference means you're highly incentivized to use this as a weapon coating rather as a, uh, than as a grenade, because DC 10 is just never going to succeed. Um, and so enemies are just always going to pass that effect, and you won't get anything out of it. As a weapon coating with DC 15, if you hit an enemy, you have a semi-reliable chance of applying the effects, which are poisoned and blinded. Just like the other poisons, if they pass the first saving throw, they become inoculated, so you only get one chance at this, but blinded is a pretty good condition. It's a step down from asleep or paralyzed, but the save DC is a little bit better, so um, you are a little bit more likely to use it. And if you use it as part of a multi-attack, blinding the enemy on your first attack means you can get advantage on subsequent attacks against that enemy, so it's definitely got some utility. Hitting those attacks can be pretty powerful. Um, it, I mean, if an enemy fails the save against Malice, then it is better than Oil of Accuracy, which is really good, but of course it's much less reliable because they won't fail the save as often. Overall, I think that the Malice effect is a reasonably strong effect. Blind is a pretty good condition. Even with save ends on the enemy turn, you're likely to get 
a few advantaged attacks out of it, and the enemy will have to make some disadvantaged attacks. Um, so Malice can be worth using. I don't think that overall it's going to be better than any of the other poisons, uh, or, or than like Crawler or Drow Poison, which both have much more debilitating conditions attached. So I'm going to put it in B tier because I think it's fine. Blinded is a, a reasonable condition. It will apply moderately frequently with a DC 15 save, but it's just not reliable enough to be a reliable effect or powerful enough to be a powerful effect. So I would generally only use it if you are out of the more powerful poisons that in the higher tiers. Next, the Oil of Bane. So the Oil of Bane, again, it's an oil, so you can only apply it to one weapon or to your weapon set directly from your inventory. You can't throw it or use it uh, as a dip or anything like that. Um, but when applied to a weapon, it gives you a bane on a stick. Enemies struck by the weapon have to make a DC 11 charisma saving throw or become baned. DC 11 obviously is very low, but unlike a bunch of the other DC 11s that we've discussed, this one targets charisma. Charisma is maybe the best uh, saving throw in the game to target. Um, a lot of enemies have very, very low charisma saves, and so against enemies with weak saves, this is actually pretty reliable. Uh, even with only DC 11, because you can just keep trying it. The Oil of Bane doesn't have the inoculation effect that the poisons do, so enemies struck by it have to make the DC 11 save every time, and when they're finally hit by it, they get baned. Bane gives them a minus 1d4 to their attack rolls and saving throws, which is a pretty good effect. Um, it's not going to be a massive boost or anything, but if you can apply a, a reasonably powerful spell that normally takes concentration and whatever without having to use any of those things just by hitting the enemy, it's something that you already want to do, then that's always worth looking at. Minus 1d4 to enemy saving throws means that subsequent control spells or whatever that you're trying to land are going to be more likely to land. Minus 1d4 to attacks won't convert that many hits into misses, but every little bit counts when the enemy actually gets to attack. So the Oil of Bane, I think, definitely has its place because it targets a good, even though it's a fairly marginal effect, because it targets a good saving throw to target and you can just keep trying until it works. The Oil of Bane is going to be pretty reliable in terms of actually landing Bane in combat, so I'm going to put it in B tier. Not the most powerful effect in the world, but it will often work, and when it does, you are reasonably happy to have it. Again, you would prefer a more powerful choice for your oil most of the time, but the Oil of Bane uh, is just a reasonable workhorse that is a good thing to put on your weapon if you don't have a better option. Next, the oil of combustion. So this is another uh, oil. You can only apply it to your weapon directly. And how it works is that after you've applied it to your weapon, when you hit an enemy with it, with no save, they get the oil of combustion condition. While they have this condition, if they're hit with any fire damage, they explode for 3d6 fire damage in a 10-foot radius around them. Um, and this Fire damage has no saving throw, not even for half. The, any, every they and everything around them will take an additional, uh, will take 3d6 fire damage, no questions asked. Obviously, this is a little dangerous if you're applying it with a melee character, because then you'll take the damage yourself. But for a ranged character, this is an extremely powerful option to get a little bit of extra uh, no save damage. The trick here is that you can have the attack that applies the oil also set it off if the weapon that attacks with it can also do fire damage because there are ways to get your weapon to do fire damage. Um, normally a weapon that's burning, so a lot of weapons that do fire damage can't have a coating, but there are ways to add fire damage to any weapon, like say the flawed Helldusk gloves, um, to, that just adds a d4 of fire damage to all your attacks, to guaranteed set off the oil of combustion and just add an AoE explosion to every attack that your archer is making, for example. Where the oil of combustion gets really ridiculous, though, is with AoE effects. If you can hit multiple enemies who are close together with it, with the same effect, the oils of combustion are going to chain together, dealing chained damage between each enemy, and stacking the more enemies are in the, the location. So with like a hunter's volley applying these all at once and setting them off, you can deal a massive amount of damage to a 
grouped uh, squad of enemies. Something like a black hole combined with an oil of combustion volley can deal an incredible amount of burst damage. I think that this is very good if you build around it, but even the default usage of just um, having some fire damage along with the oil of combustion just to add a little bit of extra damage to every archery attack in an explosion is just a very good use for oil of combustion, even aside from the chaining together and extreme power that you get if you put them in an AoE. Um, so the oil of combustion is just very, very good. I'm going to place it in S tier because it's just a very reliable way to add damage to all of your attacks, and I love reliable damage. You do have to hit an enemy with it and then deal fire damage to them, or at least hit them with a fire damage attack with the oil. Um, um, but that's a pretty easy condition to meet, and when you do meet it, you get incredible value. 3d6 damage doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it adds up when you're doing this with like every attack that you're making. Oil of Combustion, S tier. The Oil of Freezing. So the Oil of Freezing is another oil, you apply it to your weapon, and then for 10 turns, when you hit an enemy with that weapon, with no save, they become encrusted with frost for 2 turns. That's a stacking condition, so if you hit them with the weapon multiple times, they will increase the duration of the Encrusted with Frost effect, um, and what that does is give enemies disadvantage on dexterity saving throws, as well as if you hit seven turns of duration remaining on Encrusted with Frost, so if you're just using Oil of Freezing, four attacks with your weapon over two turns, because they can lose one turn of duration and you'll still hit seven, then they become then they have to pass a DC 12 Constitution saving throw, or they take 1d4 cold damage and become frozen. The 1d4 cold damage is obviously there only for flavor, but becoming frozen is very powerful. Frozen incapacitates the enemy, uh, so they can't do anything, uh, and they become vulnerable to bludgeoning, thunder, and force damage. Bludgeoning damage is very common, but also if you hit an enemy with one of those damage types, they become unfrozen again. So often you'll just want to leave them frozen. Um, DC 12... Con save is obviously very passable, uh, especially at the point in the game where you're going to get oil of freezing with reliability. Enemies will pass that save pretty reliably. But there is no inoculation against this effect, and you, so you can just keep stacking up the Encrusted with Frost, and they will keep having to make the saving throw. Um, and it's effectively free. And Frozen is a very powerful effect, so similar to Crawler Mucus or Drow Poison, the save DC might not be great, but if they fail the effect, you probably just win the encounter immediately. The upside of, of Oil of Freezing is you can have it work multiple times against the same enemy, there's no inoculation, but the downside is you need to hit them a lot before it goes off. Crawler Mucus or Drow Poison will put the freezing on them on the first attack, will put the the stun on them on the first attack, Oil of Freezing will do it on the fourth attack. However, attacks that apply multiple damage instances um, will apply the Oil of Freezing multiple times over. Stuff like the Slayer Arrows, like we talked about last time, will do two instances of Oil of Freezing in the same attack, so you can stack this up very quickly if you build for it. Even without that, though, it's pretty possible to make four attacks in a round with like a hand crossbow build or something like that, so it's pretty reliable that you can get the Oil of Freezing to be a per turn, the enemy has to make a DC-12 con save or uh, be stunned, you know, just lose the encounter immediately, they'll be frozen. Uh, so that's a pretty powerful effect by itself. This takes a little bit more work to set up than the poisons, but is a slightly more powerful effect if you can get it uh, reliably working. So I like the oil of freezing quite a bit, even if you're not putting a lot of effort into it, just the chance of freezing an enemy every couple turns is very, very powerful if you keep hitting the, enemy, the same enemies. Though, if you're hitting an enemy that many times in a combat, they're probably dead to your damage anyways, so this won't come up more than like once, but it will come up once, and once is often enough. I think just because it takes so many attacks, to apply the poison to apply the freezing unless you're doing multi-damage instant stuff in which case you're probably doing a lot of damage in an attack anyways the oil of freezing is going to go in b tier but for a build that is centered around doing enough damage instances to make it trigger very reliably it definitely goes up in value so for those builds i would put it in a or s tier but for most parties that are just going to be using it by default it's going to go in b tier where it's useful but not amazing and finally, Thistlebold's Brewed Up Belly Glummer. So despite being a poison, so you might think that it, this could be thrown as a cloud, it is not. It works more like an oil and can only be applied to your weapons. Um, and this 
gives you the brood up belly glummer effect that you can apply to an enemy with your weapon hits. An enemy struck by it has to make a DC 17 constitution saving throw, which is a pretty high saving throw. Um, DC 17 is enough that enemies will fail it pretty reliably. And if they fail the saving throw, they get disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. So basically the, the poisoned effect. Um, and also take 1d6 poison damage at the end of each of their turns. This effect lasts until they successfully pass a saving throw. They get a new one every turn. But the interesting thing about the brewed up belly glummer is that unlike the other poisons, it works more like a toxin. There is no inoculation effect against it, so enemies will, you can just keep trying to apply it until an enemy fails the saving throw. With a DC 17 saving throw, that's going to be applied pretty regularly. So this is a pretty reliable way to give an enemy, an enemy who's not immune to poisons, disadvantage on their attack rolls, which is a pretty powerful effect to apply. Disadvantage on attack rolls um, is very nice. The d disadvantage on ability checks mostly doesn't matter, and the 1d6 poison damage at the end of their turn definitely doesn't matter. Um, but the reliable disadvantage on attack rolls is actually quite good. I think that this is quite similar to Oil of Bane, although typically slightly better because the saving throw is more likely to succeed and disadvantage is better than minus 1d4 on attack rolls, but of course the Oil of Bane also affects their saving throws, which the Belly Glummer does not. If you know that a fight is going to go long, this could be a pretty good way to keep your party alive. Enemies having disadvantages is reasonably powerful, but it must be said that there's a lot of easier ways in the game to apply disadvantage to an enemy. Things like Fog Cloud or whatever do it with no saving throw at all, so the Belly Glummer is just not going to be a massive benefit to you, um, given how easy it is to duplicate its effects. Even though this applies pretty regularly and is pretty reasonable, I think that most of the time if you want to give an enemy disadvantage you are better off doing it in a way that has no saving throw, like a Fog Cloud or something else like that. Um, so I'm going to put the Belly Glummer in C tier because I I think that its its effects are just so easily duplicatable. So even though it's relatively reliable, um, it's similar to the basic poison in that uh, the disadvantage is inherently defensive. The disadvantage on enemy attacks is inherently defensive. So you're not getting you're not getting the encounter over with quicker by using this. And by the point in the game where you get access to this reliably, you can pretty easily duplicate its effect otherwise. But the effects are are reasonable, and so if you don't have a better way to apply disadvantage, the Belly Glummer has got your back. Alright my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at the poisons, oils, and weapon coatings available in Baldur's Gate 3. I think that this is a pretty fun uh, list, but to be honest, this is one of the tier lists that I am least certain about my placements of. I think that these are all very contextual items. Builds built around maximizing them are going to change the evaluation of these items significantly. Um, so I think that the the way that these items interact means that a tier list, uh, doing a tier list like this is inherently pretty difficult, and I could see a lot of these items moving around pretty significantly, especially depending on what party you've got. For example, arsonist oil, oil of combustion, oil of freezing, etc. are all items that are going to change their effects uh, drastically depending on what your builds are, change their impact drastically depending on what your builds are. Um, so I could see moving any of those around pretty significantly depending on your playstyle. That being said, I think if you just, if what you take away from this is diluted oil of sharpness, oil of accuracy, and crawler mucus, and just use those all game, you will do absolutely amazing. So um, those are the ones that I would really keep an eye out for because they're extremely good. As always, my friends, if you've enjoyed the video, please feel free, of course, to leave a comment and like the video. I both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm, so I really do appreciate people taking the time to do that. It really helps me out and means a lot when you take your time to leave a comment, and of course let me know what you think I should move around. Like I said, this is one where I can see a lot of these moving pretty significantly depending on people, people's playstyles, and it's very possible there has there is stuff that I have missed with the application of these weapon coatings because they are particular to how different parties play, so definitely let me know what you think should move around. 
All right, my friends, hope you enjoyed the video, and I will catch you next time.